Hello, everybody. Today we are showing entries from the February Art Dare, and we are also introducing the April Art Dare. If you would like to grow as an artist and you can't take an art class, we've got everything you need here at Art Prof, critiques, tutorials, professional development, and workshops. The February Art Dare was to create a 2D or 3D artwork of any dessert. And the first artist we're going to take a look at is Kay. And Kay explains, I'm a hobby artist, lifelong learner, and love observing the details in everyday life. And so Kay tried out chalk pastels and sketched the Bread Fairy's lemon tarts, which had the most perfect toasted meringue. So taking a look at these um, sketches, Mia, there's a lot of various things going on. What do you think about these sketches? I think this is a great way to plan for a final image. And all of these, um, it feels like a collection of ideas, almost like a Pinterest board or, or um, somebody's notebook, which I really love. Um, and uh, the color scheme, especially in this one, almost reminds me of like a biology textbook, sort of <laughs> those molecule illustrations, which is just a cool thematic um, <laughs> like marriage of dessert and sort of anatomical drawings, which which I love. And that can it speaks to color scheme and um, lots of different ideas in your work. So I think it's really cool. I just love how we go from this one to this one. And how we also see in the previous images that Kay's really almost creating a landscape here. And then you go to the sketches of the food and then it, it just all comes together. And even though the sketches look unrelated, this becomes this landscape of jelly and all these delectable <laughs> things to eat. I mean, I feel like I wanna just jump in there. <laughs> I know. I feel like I'm simultaneously underwater, like through seaweed, looking at something. I feel like um, I'm in that one scene in Shark Boy and Lava Girl, where in the um, in the land of milk and cookies. I don't know if people <laughs> will understand that reference, but it's like really huge life size life size desserts. So um, props to you, like thinking about scale that much in your final image. I think that's awesome. Well, Seven A says it looks like an underwater buffet, which Sounds really good. I guess I'd have to be in SpongeBob though. You know, when they have like fire underwater, <laughs> it just all works, <laughs> that type of thing. Okay, next artist is Mark. And Mark explains that he thinks of ice cream. There's always room for ice cream. And Mark used Blender, starting with the cookies and the ice cream, then the cone, and then added some googly eyes to make it cute. And isn't this so fun to see Mark building the model? Oh my gosh. Yeah. As somebody who's tried and failed at Blender a couple times, it is so impressive. Um, even when somebody makes like a really impressive cube or something like that. So to make this really dynamic ice cream character is something that's super impressive. Um, I also really love the color scheme that you chose. This sort of salmon-y. It looks appetizing. Like I would really eat this. <laughs> I just love the little drips like that drip on the right hand side and then you can feel sort of the goo that's on the top part and oh my god I love cookies in my ice cream. I know this is such a dynamic cone. Oh, I feel bad now saying I'd eat it because it's really adorable and probably <laughs> you know like alive but it's a, I love it it's, it's uh, delicious. I like that Mark turned it into a character as well because I think there is something sort of playful about sweets and it, it works beautifully. I mean, I feel like the eyes look like malt balls or something. And so it is quite thorough in that way. All right, the next artist is Jonah Lynn. And Jonah Lynn has a lot of cool information. I'm not gonna read the whole thing, but there are images of sweet breads, caramelized plantain spring rolls, and caramelized deep fried sweet potatoes on skewers, sweet puff pastries, sweet red put. I mean, I'm there. <laughs> this is really fantastic. So what do you think about these, Mia? And by the way, everybody, Jonah Lynn did several pieces, not just one. Wow. Well, sweet potato has been my weird food focus for the past couple months now. So I'll have to try 
this this recipe but um like look at all of the amazing transparency and layers in these pieces um this one i really love the little speckles on top it looks like it just adds some dy uh, dynamic um texture to the final piece um it looks like something comforting that i want to have around my house like in my kitchen <laughs> to look at while i eat these beautiful desserts and i love the composition the way we have this looks like raspberry jelly or something it's sort of like tunneling across the page coming forward and then you have the pastries in the upper left those are sort of being pushing back into space and so not only is there's this sort of visceral quality of feeling like you can taste the textures in it but i feel like jonalyn made them look so gigantic like they're just sort of bursting out of the composition Great British Bake Off should hire all of these people, all of these beautiful artists. <laughs> Snap Sketch says so much deliciousness in this stream. And Manette says everyone is so impressive. It's so interesting how differently people interpreted the prompt. And I felt like I really got to know all these different pastries from all over the world because I haven't heard of most of the desserts that people are showing. And to me, that's the best part of our global community. Okay, next artist is William. And William has so much history in here, which I think is really interesting. Um, there is one of a Sunday afternoon cake inspired by the 1900s European still lives. And the cookie with the oatmeal is about a tired soldier during the Afghanistan conflict getting a moment of peace to enjoy his government issued dessert from his MRE ration. And so he talks more in the rest of the thing about um, a simple cookie can mean the world to someone going through the war. And I just think this is such an interesting take because Typically, we think about desserts as just sort of like a fun and silly sometimes because that's what they are. But this is a historical context we're looking at here. Yeah, I think it really opens um, someone's eyes, especially living like nowadays in in the spot that we're in. You know, uh, we have the privilege of not really worrying about the next time we're going to get a delicious cookie where that's definitely not a reality for a lot of people. Um, and so to kind of merge the themes of something so sweet and good with with that underbelly of um, pain and and suffering. It's a really interesting uh, concept to dive into. And so I think it's um, what a beautiful way to bring that idea out and to express that in art um, and to get us talking about it. Creates a context because food is served in many different places and we react differently depending on where we're receiving it. On the other hand, William also created this gooey cake. And I just imagine this is really moist. And I have to say my pet peeve is dry cakes. You know, they just, oh, they're so bad. I love moist chocolate cake. Oh, so good. <laughs> oh yeah, it makes a complete difference. Who was that artist? I'm sure that it was on the um, the first stream, the the artist that did cake, but um, made it look like real frosting. It was such thick, amazing application. Wayne Tebow. Cake. Yes, it really is reminiscent of that artist. So it's really, I think that you really executed this in a great way. Um, and what a what a testament to the um, moistness and and fluffiness of the cake by using paint in this way. So very very smart. And also the contrast against the cake platter and the bowl, you guys can notice that William painted the paint there very thin. And so that actually makes the thicker paint in the cakes work out even more um, prominently in the piece. Okay, the next artist is Amber. And Amber says that I wanted to challenge myself by using a larger space. And Amber says, struggle the most getting the ice cream to not look like a pile of random blobs. Well, that is kind of what ice cream is. So let's take a look. And who here has had one of these before? Because I had one in Japan, but it wasn't full of ice cream. It had red bean inside. I'm totally blanking on what the name is. But uh, Mia, what do you think of this? And we, we have some progress pieces too. 
I've never had a dessert like this before, but I want one real bad, especially after seeing this. I think that it's awesome. Um, like Clara said, like ice cream kind of is a bunch of random blobs, but I think that you really focused on those intricate textures that um, immediately reads as ice cream, like the swirl and all of the value in that swirl. And um, the colors are very appetizing, which is another really great thing. Also, I love the, uh, the frame choice that was in the first image. I think that it's really good and it um, complements the painting very nicely. I mean, this doesn't look like random blobs to me. <laughs> it looks like you beautifully rendered that soft serve shape. And then the, the colors are so unusual. It's like green and then the purple. And you, you just really, Amber, went all the way. The colors are super vibrant. And I, I don't know, I just look at that, I'm like, oh, strawberry pocky, soft serve. And it's even one of those, you know, those long cookies? I used to eat those when I was a kid. Do you know what I'm talking about? I don't know. Like little... bis biscotti or? It's not biscotti. It's like a little, um, a little cylinder and it's very thin and it has oh, like thin like wafers wafer? and chocolate. Yeah, yeah. Like a yeah. wafer kind of straw thing. I know what you're talking about. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. Megan says, love the colors of the ice cream. Katz says, it looks like the fish is enjoying the ice cream. Really cute. I think that's a great take on that. Fantastic. All right. The next artist is Francis. And Francis is talking about the moment of enjoying the dessert, especially when I was a kid and didn't care about making a mess. And so... Francis talks about time on a windy day, got all my hair, took ages to wash out, pink from the cake. And so here we have the reference. This looks like my kid on her first birthday. We just gave her a big hunk of chocolate cake and went, yep, go ahead. Yeah, I think that's definitely like a, a canon event when it comes to kids um, not really eating the cake, but just making a mess everywhere with it. So I think yep. that this painting really captures that feeling. It almost feels like an outside birthday party or something, too, with the background color. I feel like you've put us in a setting where we feel like we're watching this kid eat this cake at a birthday party. And um, that's very cool. I think the hair is so expressive. If you imagine if this person just had their hair tied back, I don't feel like I would get much of a sense of that. So it's like you say, you can feel the wind, even though we don't actually see anything in the background. And then you combine that with the mess on the face. It's like, oh man, this is going to be a lot to clean up later. And Lisa says, I remember being kicked outside to eat something messy as a kid. Wow, I was never that organized. <laughs> it's like, yep, make it, we'll clean it up as somebody who has cleaned up Cheerios off the floor. But don't you love the color, Mia, the way the green is so vibrant? Yeah, and it contrasts the um, pink and purples of the ice cream in the mouth so well. It feels like we're really focused in on that area. And um, I think it's just a very smart use of color and composition. I also love the subtle way that the eyes are looking down yeah, um, yeah. at the ice cream cone. It, it has that weird sense of like a kid that can only focus on this one thing to the point of like delusion almost. So I think that's a funny, um, funny choice. Charismatic says, I feel like the windiness of the hair adds to the messiness of the cake. And we also have Megan who says, get someone who loves you how this girl loves ice cream. Very good suggestion. Okay, we have Uma is the next artist. And by the way, I don't know if people saw Uma's capybaras with all of the pumpkins and the squash from an earlier art dare, but I just think it's awesome how this is carried over from a previous art dare Uma did. And so Uma did images from Favorite local bakery, Indian Japanese fusion. Oh gosh, I don't know how to pronounce all this stuff. Ladu Barfi, a rose pistachio donut, Galam Jamun cake. And so now we have a capybara, baby capybara, with watermelon dessert pizza, because apparently capybaras really love watermelon. So here are the beginning pieces. What do you think of the capybaras and dessert? And <laughs> I just think this is such a kick. 
<laughs> it's such an inter like it's such a cool little combination of ideas. I would never think of adding capybaras, but it I think it speaks to your style in art and sort of that stylistic individualistic twist that every artist kind of puts on a piece. So um, I think it's fun. It, it definitely makes it more dynamic. I also love these one-off illustrations. I feel like I opened up a cookbook um, and these are just there. I remember when I was a kid, one of my favorite things to do was look at the illustrations of cookbooks. And um, it's really reminiscent of that. I love your use of traditional media as well. I think it's so charming. The way that it's popping out of this white background is so satisfying. Um, and it draws us right in. And the capybara is just so cute. <laughs> I, I just love that he has to stand on his toes <laughs> to reach the top of the cake. That is just so funny. And then it's weird how this, this is just like a slice of watermelon, but because of the way Uma has presented it, it really functions the way we expect a slice of cake to go. And I, I just think that is so smart to do it that way um, because if it's, standing up, we just, oh, it's watermelon. But here it's like, oh no, that is definitely a substitute for a cake. Really fun, super whimsical, Uma. I think we need to see more copy bars from you in other contexts in the future. A full what about this one? Oh my God. <laughs> Oh, okay. I like this one even more. This is hilarious. It feels like um, you could, this feels like a costume that you could sew for your dog or something or a capybara <laughs> and have them walk around as a pile of ice cream. I just noticed that each scoop is a different capybara. Yes. Oh my gosh. That is hilarious. How do you come up with these ideas? I think it's awesome. All right. The next artist who, by the way, is here live with us in the chat this is um, Sarah, and Sarah says, love observing the details in everyday scenes. Our cross videos have inspired me to try chalk pastels. I love how painterly they are. And so this is the Bread Fairy's lemon tarts. And these were so tiny, they were like that big. And she just brought over this whole tray of these lemon meringue tarts. And so Sarah, to me, I, I love that you captured almost their choreography. Like, doesn't it look like this one's sort of twirling? <laughs> yeah, they look so good. They look so appetizing. And the medium that you chose works so well with this specific um, treat. I know, uh, Clara, you use like the pastels and the chalk and it really brings out the fluffiness of the dessert. And I think that you are doing such a good job with that here. Um, Oh my gosh, I just want to eat it. It does look like they're dancing somehow. Also that lemon curd, oh my gosh. I really, really like lemon curd. And so to me, when I see that like juiciness in that little glimmer of highlight, it's just the greatest thing. And really this is how they felt. They were all swirled, but each one was a little different. And the thing I like about homemade food is that it's not neat that every one is like a little quirky and weird. And I feel like Sarah, you really captured that in that all of these feel like they have their own types of forms. That blue oh. color in the in the background. Oh, sorry. The, no, the blue color in the background in the right corner is maybe my favorite um, use of color in this piece too, that sort of pastel blue color. It's so nice as a shadow and it like, that's so frosting meringue. Uh, it's so such a cool choice. Good color choice. By the way, Uma says, deal. We'll bring on more capybara. My husband came up with the ice cream illustration. Well, you may have to put him to work again, Uma, because we really liked that idea. <laughs> okay, the next artist is Alan. And Alan says that this is uh, inspired, quote, by my favorite dessert, jelly and custard. I chose my favorite scene of smog in the Hobbit lying in the gold, but it's the dragon. Okay. Scene where the dragon is being asked to grant a wish to trespassers. So apparently the dragon is sitting in jelly and custard. <laughs> I think that's so funny. And it kind of works thematically too, because I think dragons are known to hoard treasure and gold and things that they deem valuable. So to have this dragon's, treasure be this delicious custard is kind of funny. Um, 
I, I think it's a cool idea. I wonder even like if this was a whole series, you could just add more desserts to this piece and have it be just a treasure trove of like all of these different kinds of desserts. I can just see it in my brain. I just like how goopy it looks. I think some of it is that lighter peach color that's surrounding all of the dragon parts. It, it feels like it has that jiggle <laughs> that you get. I mean, but I love custard, you guys. Like I could eat custard all day long. So I don't know, maybe this just appeals to me for that reason. But also Mia, isn't the background great? Oh yeah, I think it's cool. I think um, it makes me feel like I'm really down in the deep caves or um, what is it, Mordor or somewhere. <laughs> um, I love it. Yeah, I'm not super well versed in in the world, but <laughs> but I think that you did a really great job expressing this and in, um, in in merging the two worlds of uh, sweet desserts and um, fantasy worlds. <laughs> All right, next artist is Manette. And I remember, Minette, when you were working on this and you were posting the updates in the art there, and I know you had had a lot of problems putting it together. Like Minette says, there's a lot of trial and error, a lot of things out of your comfort zone, clay, acrylics, digital art, box out of a cardboard tray. And look at this. We also have um, the dog in here. And look at this preparation. I mean, isn't this nuts this is so cool i'm always a fan of using um uh out of the ordinary painting surfaces so to have sort of a mosaic of this little dessert dog or a sweet tart dog yeah sweet <sighs> sweet tarts that is so for lack of a better term sweet and lovely and adorable and i think it's so interesting like it's so it's so charming and um this was around valentine's day too so Yes. It's a perfect kind of tribute to um, your Valentine, this little dog. I mean, Manette, so many parts to this. The digital drawing of the dog, the box that you made, making these clay pieces. I mean, this really was a labor of love. And by the way, everybody, Manette is here live in the chat. Had to include a photo. Of course you did. How else could we show the work without seeing your inspiration. So great job, Manette, for sticking with this piece, because I know sometimes we do things that we're not super familiar with, and it is easy to get frustrated. But I mean, Mia, that perseverance is so important. Oh, yeah. And and from beginning to end, like that, you could have so easily just, um, you know, uh, rushed it or quit halfway through you didn't have to make this box you could have just stopped with the hearts but the fact that you really tied all those loose ends together is so impressive and um you can the the end result is seamless and everyone can definitely appreciate that all right next artist is cat's glitter box who i believe is here live in the chat and so clat uh, the cats is talking about mochi nostalgic childhood treat for me and Kat says, so whenever I'm in a sushi restaurant, which offers them, I order some. And it's based on a photo and it's a digital illustration in Procreate. What do you think about these mochi? Oh, I think it's great. I tried to eat mochi, but my teeth are so sensitive. So if anyone has tips about how to eat mochi, in oh! way, I won't hurt my teeth. Please let me know. Um, but this looks so appetizing. I'm I'm really wishing that I could eat one now. And I love the um, the the slices in there too. I think when I think of mochi, I just think of the ones that just come out of a box or something, but this really is a display that um, I think it's really great. And the texture, the little textures and the shine from the plate onto the, um, oh, onto the treat. And then um, that sort of, yeah, exactly. That color is so good. It's yellow. Um, yeah. So, so well, um, the, the, the attention is really great. Yeah, it's interesting because a lot of people, I think, would have spent all the time on the mochi. But one thing that I like that cats did is showing whole plate, showing the entire table, the slight sheen that's in there. And it's like, now that I'm looking at the whole piece, it's like you really feel the lights that are above in the restaurant. And then all the different textures, like the mochi is very graphic because it's been cut. But then those little drizzles 
Oh my god, I need to eat something sweet after this treat. <laughs> We're like describing all these delicious things. That chocolate sauce is so well done. I want them. <laughs> I want to eat them. Yeah, Charismatic says, I feel like I can taste this. I think that there are artworks where we have this physical reaction to them. And I think that Katz's work is very um, enticing in that way. All the gleam of the lighting and the colors is just really beautifully done. Oh, we have a suggestion for you, Mia. Pagarami says, getting actual mochi filled with red bean paste or whatever, not the ice cream mochi from Trader Joe's. My teeth are very sensitive too. Yeah, if you go to Chinatown, there's like stacks of mochi. Oh my gosh, I have to make a trip. I have to make a trip yes. and, and do a taste review, <laughs> teeth review. Oh wait, Katz is here. Thank you so much. Sorry for making you all hungry. Hope you all get to have something yummy soon. I know, this is like torture. This stream is awful. <laughs> <laughs> Next artist is Megan, who is here live with us in the chat. And so Megan talks about loving cherry cheesecake. This is done with alcohol markers, white acrylic marker. And then Megan did a play and use exacto knife and glue stick to attach the desert. So here's where Megan started, which ugh, that gooey. <laughs> oh God, I love cheesecake. <laughs> do you like cheesecake, Mia? I do. I didn't used to, and now I like it. I think that my frontal lobe is snapping into place because now I like cheesecake. So that's my well, that's cheesecake. My for me is quite nostalgic because my mom used to make it all the time. We had this really, really simple recipe. It has like three ingredients in it. And I just grew up eating cheesecake. And then, wow, that landscape, that is the coolest thing, Megan. That is the last thing I'd ever expect to see on a piece of cheesecake. But it definitely is your personal narrative in that dessert. It works so well too, just as an image. I saw this one first and this made more sense somehow as the final image than the first rendering did. So I think that this is just a really cool artistic choice that you made. I think just also the um, contrast between that sort of purple hazy texture and color scheme of the desert um, and then the shadow of your collage and then that pop of red uh, it really brings out that um, delicious uh, sheen of the cherry. And I don't, I'm just so hungry. <laughs> so, oh, I think I need to go to the so grocery store after this. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> okay. And Marley's introduced me to something that I'd never heard of before. So these are transparent cakes. And also Marley's did... Uh, pas I think it's pastis de nata. I'm totally saying it wrong, but it's that egg tart dessert that they have in Portugal. Me and Kat ate a lot when I was in Portugal. And so Marley's explains painting with transparency was a challenge. Used watercolor pencils and put a little water on top of it without totally blurring the structure. So this is a transparent cake. If people don't know what it looks like, I'd never heard of Who here has heard of these before? I'd never heard of this until I saw Marley's work, but how do you think Marley's did? I think that the transparency is definitely coming across. I just love. Um, I think that the, oh wait, you might be lagging a little bit. Oh, I hope not. Did, did I break up? Oh. Sorry. <laughs> you go. <laughs> oh yeah, that's okay. Well, I was, I was okay. just saying that the transparency effect is really working. And um, I think that there are blueberries on the plate there and the yeah. blueberries mixed with the blue of the plate. And look at those little intricate details on the plate too. That sort of engraving, carving detail. It really complements the, um, the sheer details within the transparency. It's almost like there's berries or something floating suspended in the cake itself and it's just weird like i don't know if i would want to eat this but i think that it's beautifully <laughs> rendered <laughs> it all depends on the taste and so yeah. these are the egg custards the the ones i had in portugal were so rich i mean i couldn't even eat a full one they were just so full of just gooey egg stuff. And I think Marley's really captured the flakiness because the ones in Portugal, 
it's like 20 layers of flakiness. They're, they're really extraordinary. So I was very happy to relive that experience through your artwork, Marley's. We have some prizes to give out everybody. The honorable mention goes to Jonalyn, congratulations. And the winner is Mark. Congratulations to everybody. I had so much fun seeing what everybody did this month and thank you for participating and supporting each other. Before we announce the Art Dare, we do have spaces in our April workshops, color palettes, drawing hands and feet, and also imaginary landscapes. More information on how to register is in the video description below and also on the front page of artprof.org. This is the April Art Dare. It is to create artwork with anything but your dominant hand. So you can make this with your left, well, for me, <laughs> my left hand is the one that is not my dominant hand, or any other way you can hold a paintbrush to make the work. Because as some of you guys may have seen, Lauren had hand surgery and is no longer able to paint the way she normally does. And so she's actually switched to procreate. She is an acrylic painter. Typically that's her practice, but she's having a lot of fun. She said, learning how to be an artist in a different way. And Mia, sometimes we have to do that. Yeah. I think being an artist is being able to adapt to different life circumstances and, you know, um, autonomy. Auto Autonomy. Autonomy. <laughs> Autonomy. <laughs> Thank you. Um, and so I think that being a true creative means that um, the ideas and artistry sort of flows out of you however way um, it can. And so Lauren's experience is just a testament to how creative she is. And um, lots of artists have gone through this type of thing. So I'm really excited to see what people make. Including yourself. Tell us, Mia, because I know you were doing these just gorgeous ballpoint pen drawings and beautiful character work on Procreate, but you actually found that it wasn't sustainable long term. Yeah, so sort of opposite from Lauren's experience, I feel like um, my I was doing a lot of character driven work and things that required me to really grip a pencil and, um, you know, press down really hard and render a lot of things to a very detailed extent. And um, it was not very sustainable for the health of my hand and wrist. I had a lot of repetitive stress injuries, so I had to... Um, shift my focus to traditional media in order to have, um, and by traditional media, I mean more like flowy painterly type of work so that I wasn't um, putting so much pressure on my body. And um, I found I actually enjoyed it even more. So it sort of shifted my focus from this um, digital heavy character design, heavy work to what I'm doing nowadays, which is way more painterly and, and gesture focused. So it's interesting to see how the consequences of um, your body can affect the work that you make. <laughs> and the thing is, <clears throat> digital didn't disappear from your artwork. You do still touch up a lot of your traditional paintings, but it's not to the degree that, oh, you're doing everything and procreate. So it's almost like digital found a different role in your studio practice. Yeah, I think everything um, to a certain extent, you know, like I, I think when I was doing digital full time for hours a day, it was just not a healthy practice at all. But now I'm able to incorporate it into my, uh, my skill set in a way that is beneficial to both my traditional paintings and um, my overall arts practice. So yeah, I because made a work. piece like this really was too difficult for you to do. Yeah, I mean, it was fun and I and I loved doing it and it was a style that I was really experimenting with. Um, but I think that I, there was a turning point where I could have really committed and chosen this as the way that I wanted to express my ideas. And um, I just kind of knew that in the long run, it would not, it wouldn't fly and it would be pretty painful overall. So, yeah. Megan says, I'm excited. I have done quite a bit with my non-dominant hand because of hand issues as well. Lisa's thinking I might try with my toes. So looks like we've got some ideas or Lisa even says, I hear some people hold their tool 
in their mouths. So this will be really fun. I mean, this is the same thing as the hand thing, but when I was pregnant with my first kid, I was very worried about solvents and chemicals and things like that. So I just decided, you know, I'm just going to take a break while I'm pregnant from doing oil painting. So I ended up doing all these crayon drawings, but I got so into the crayon drawings, I actually never went back to oil painting. And so sometimes it can feel like a setback where, oh, I'm not able to do the thing that I was doing before, but it's, it's sort of cool how it, it led me down this other path. I was not planning it. And yet I love the direction that my work took. I think it's a lot of, uh, it's a great way to grow as well. Like learning new arts practices and ways to um, bring ideas to life. It's, it's all in good um, creative spirit. And this is an artist. Um, he was an Irish writer and artist, Christy Brown. I don't know if some of you guys may have seen this film that was made about his life. This was made in the 80s. Daniel Day-Lewis, I believe, won an Oscar for this film. If you guys haven't seen it, I, I haven't seen it in decades, like literally. I can't even remember anything that happened in the movie at all. But it's a really interesting story because he was born with cerebral palsy and he was a full out painter. I mean, had a whole studio practice. This is an image of his um, of him painting. He painted with his left foot. He was able to do a typewriter and also these paintings. And I mean, I love this drawing. Like this drawing totally up my alley, Mia. Oh yeah, the gesture and the expression and the detail, the the detail, but also the um, spontaneity of the marks and everything. I don't know if he would be able to achieve this if he wasn't doing it in the exact way that he was. So that's just a testament to his artistic prowess, I guess. Charismatic says, I've been told I hold my pens and pencils like a lefty, which is weird because I use my right. I never thought of any other way to hold them. Yeah, one of my kids grips their pencil in the most bizarre way. And I, I look, I'm like, how, how do you draw with this? And yet she's really good at all the things that she does. So I think it's a really interesting exploration of just what we can do and sort of thinking beyond the more obvious choice, which for a lot of people would be their dominant hand. And so what happens when you take away that experience and you have to find a new one, a new way to do things. And I mean, I love how rich his paintings are. I mean, this is so dense with color, the subtlety, and I just love that he was able to really be a practicing artist in this way. By the way, this is a portrait of his palette, and I just love how textured his work is, like that background with the white, and then he's building up the paint and everything. So great artists, take a look at his work. All right, so if you do the Art Dare Leap, which by the way, it's not required to enter the Art Dare to do this, but sometimes people want a bigger project to do for the month. So you're gonna create four artworks, but each of them has to be a different body part. So one, if you wanted to paint with your mouth, another one is with your elbow, however you guys wanna do it is great. Hang out in our Discord. We do have a channel that is for the art darers and it's super fun to see all of the entries coming in during the month. Also people sharing their works in progress, sometimes bouncing ideas off of each other is a really great place to watch everybody's progress. To officially enter, you want to tag us on Instagram. Make sure you guys tag us because Instagram did this annoying thing where we can no longer search recent posts. We can only search recent top posts. It's so obnoxious. So you guys have to make sure that you do the tag in addition to the hashtag because we've been having trouble finding people's stuff for that reason. So really make sure you tag us. And if you are not on social media, you can certainly submit on our website. If you guys go to Art Dares in the menu, you will find the page and you will see that we do have a Google submission form for people who are not on Instagram. Remember, Color Palettes Workshop, Drawing Hands and Feet, Imaginary Landscapes. We still have a couple spots left. This is your chance 
to work with me in real time in a small group of artists. I always tell people the workshops are my treat for doing all the administrative stuff. <laughs> Join our Discord. This is a great place to hang out with our staff. And Mia will be in the chat in the post live streams channel. I think it'd be really fun for all of you guys to hang out with her because Mia hasn't been in the Discord for a little bit. So this will be a great chance for you guys to check in. Join our Patreon group. This is where you get to share your art with staff in weekly voice sessions. I write very, very long critiques. And you can also make art friends because it's a much smaller group. We have like 11,000 members now. It's a lot of people. So That's the Patreon crazy. group. I know. I was like, what happened? <laughs> Thank you to our incredible top Patreon supporters who make everything we do possible. You guys are still the bulk of our budget. Thank you. Visit artprof.org. There's lots of content on there that's not on YouTube. Use the search bar. Art Prof has a podcast. It's available on Spotify and also on iTunes. And Buddy would like for you to subscribe for more tutorials, critiques, and business tips. Everybody, thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next time. Bye.